So today we want to show you um, a bunch of the stuff that we have coming in .NET Core 3 Wave. Yeah. Whether you want to build a WinForm or WPF app on .NET Core, uh, we're going to show you some of the new web technology we have with Razor components, which allows you to build a spa-like application using C Sharp uh, without having to use Angular, React, or Vue to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and we also are going to show you some really cool machine learning yeah. using ML.NET, how you can take your existing C Sharp .NET skills and use those to use ML in your application. How's it going? So let's, uh, let's get started. Hi. Um, I'm Scott Hunter, uh, the Director of Program Management at Microsoft on the .NET platform. I've got Alia with me as well. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a Program Manager on the .NET desktop. And today we're here to talk to you about .NET Core 3. Um, first off, .NET is our platform for building any type of application. We think if you build a desktop app, a web app, a cloud app, a mobile app, a game, IoT or AI, .NET can do the, all of those workloads. Um, but today we're here to talk about .NET Core 3. Uh, Preview 2 just became available and one of the big themes in .NET Core 3 is letting you build desktop applications on .NET Core. So we've brought uh, support for WinForms and WPF to .NET Core. We've also brought NDD Framework 6 to .NET Core. So you can open up uh, and use all of the capabilities of .NET Core now for desktop development. That includes our uh, deployment of using side-by-side. -side. You can have multiple free versions of .NET Core on your machine, unlike having one version of .NET Framework. You can build a self-contained exe. You can take a single WinForm application, compile it into an exe that contains the app mm -hmm. and the actual uh, framework. We have some new uh, enhancements in web as well. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll show some client-side development with web. Um, and as always, .NET Core is our high-performance .NET, and we have a bunch of performance improvements that will come with .NET Core 3. Um, I'm super happy to also mention that, you know, .NET Core has always been open source. Right. And now we've actually open sourced Windows Forms yes. and WPF as well. So as we bring these new libraries to .NET Core, we open source them and uh, we've yep. been very happy so far. We've, yep. uh, the GitHub repos for both of these have had lots of pull requests and lots of issues from the community. So we're already starting to see the benefits of open source there. Um, this is the picture as of today. We shipped .NET Core 2.2. Uh, in early December, and the primary workloads were web and cloud. But as we move into the .NET Core 3 wave, uh, you can see I'm adding desktop development with WinForms and WPF. I'm adding IoT, uh, and I'm adding uh, support for ML using AI. Um, and so we're super excited about you know, .NET Core 3. The big workloads we have here, obviously the desktop stuff is coming. Um, AI and ML is coming as well. Uh, we'll demo some of that. And there's a whole bunch of enhancements to web, uh, both in the terms of microservices and in the terms of client-side development. But we're here today mainly to talk about desktop. Um, so let's talk about some of the enhancements that are coming in this wave. Uh, first off, when we built ASP.NET years ago, um, I remember when we added MVC, then Web API, then SignalR, we had this challenge that uh, customers might already have a web form application and they might, might want to use some Web API or some MVC. Um, and we used to make them only choose one at a time, but we came up with this notion called one ASP.NET where any ASP.NET project could, could actually use all of those things. Uh, the Windows team went through the same kind of uh, model where uh, they introduced a universal Windows platform a couple of years ago, and it was targeting desktop and mobile and mm -hmm. uh, tablets. Uh, but to, to write a UWP application, you had to start all over again and you couldn't use the stuff you actually knew before. Um, and so as part of this wave, uh, just like with one ASP.NET, you can now take a WinForm app or a WPF application and you can actually use those UWP controls inside of that application. So I might have a, an old WinForm application and I want to let somebody write a signature with their finger on a touch screen. Yeah. Now I can just add a UWP touch screen control to my WinForm application awesome. and I'm good. Um, as you're building a WinForm or WPF application, we want to make sure you have access to all the Windows 10 APIs. So you can take advantage of all the latest features in, in the Windows operating system in your WinForm and WPF apps. Um, and then finally, um, all of the XAML islands, XAML controls, that's all coming uh, to .NET Framework 4.8 as well. So whether you're core or .NET Framework, 
you're going to get access to these capabilities. Next is, you know, I've already got a WinForm application running on .NET Framework. Why do I want to move it to core? I mentioned before, uh, what makes core interesting is I can have more than one on the machine at a time. I can have m as many as I want side by side by side. Um, you might want to do this because let's say you're a developer and mm -hmm. you want to take advantage of the latest version of WinForms. Right. Yes. Today that means let's call IT, let's tell IT I want to put the latest version of .NET Framework on all the machines in the building. Right. Uh, that's hard to do. With .NET Core, I don't have to make that ask. I can actually take, uh, as a development team, I can say, I want to use the latest WinForm or WPF features, and maybe I don't even want to have a framework installed on the machine at all. I can compile that, that, that WinForm application to a single exe mm -hmm. that contains mm -hmm. my app and contains .NET Core, and so IT doesn't have to do anything other than put the, the exe on the machines. That's, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> so that, that is uh, an awesome reason to move to Core. Right. Uh, the next one is, .NET Framework is, is, you know, it's been around for 18 years, and it's on every Windows machine. Uh, because of that, it's hard for us to change it without making some kind of breaking change. Uh, the side-by-side -side capabilities of .NET Core let me improve the APIs in ways I can't in .NET Framework. And so you get, advantage, you get access to all the latest uh, runtime and API improvements we made with Core, um, and some of those improvements include uh, massive performance improvements. And so by moving your application uh, from, from .NET Framework to .NET Core, you get much better control over deployment, you get new APIs, um, and you get more performance. Uh, so those are some great reasons to move to Core. Uh, this is kind of how we, we see the picture of .NET um, as we are today. Uh, I've got .NET Framework 4.8. If you have existing .NET applications, great place to keep them. Run them there uh, for as long as you want. Um, highly compatible. We're going to try not to make any breaking changes there. Uh, but if you want to move to the faster track, you've got this .NET Core over here. And you can see I've got ML.NET. I've got data with EF6 and EF Core. I've got great web with ASP.NET Core. And we just, just now are adding WPF and WinForms to this stack uh, on Windows. Let's talk about the preview uh, that just shipped. Yeah. Uh, preview, preview 2 just came out. And so if you want to build a Core 3 application, um, you can do that with VS 2019. Uh, you can do that with VS for Mac or VS Code. I do want to tell people there are some limitations today. Um, we have not yet got the designers running in Visual Studio 2019. They'll, it'll come in a later release. Um, and we don't have the templates in the product yet either. Uh, but both of those things are easy to work around, and Ollie and I will show that today. Yeah. Um, I'm going to quickly go through the steps required to migrate an application. Um, as this video comes out, we'll do a blog post uh, and paste all these steps in there and a link to the video so you can find all this stuff. Uh, there's a couple of big things you want to do as you move an app to core. Uh, first thing is uh, we introduce something called .NET Standard, and that is a specification of all the APIs that work on all of our platforms. So if you make a, a class library that runs in .NET Standard, it's guaranteed to work on desktop, mm -hmm. on mobile, on web. Um, and so the first thing we recommend is move your class libraries to .NET Standard. Uh, the next thing is, these are desktop apps. Um, right. We know they're desktop apps. Yep. They only run on Windows. So if there's a Windows API that we couldn't put in .NET Standard, we created a compatibility pack that brings things like mm -hmm. directory services, registry, um, back to uh, .NET Core for desktop applications. So you might want to include that to bring those APIs you're missing. Uh, we have an awesome analyzer, which you can actually add to your project. And what it will do is it will actually um, look at the APIs you're using and tell you if they actually work on all the platforms. So you can understand, is your code portable or not? Uh, the next step, um, and this is a, a dense kind of slide, so I think we'll just better off demoing it. Uh, and we'll just move on from here and, and go right to a demo. Um, I'm going to hand the machine over to Alia. And what we're going to do here is, um, she and I were chatting a few weeks ago, and I said it would be interesting to take a, an old WinForms game uh, and port it over to Core. So yeah. we're going to start going through the same steps we just showed you. So first off, what is this thing? So Scott, do you remember the game from your childhood, the memory game, when you have cards and you open two at a time and you're trying to find the matching cards? So that's what it is. And uh, let's try to find a match. <laughs> Here you go. I do remember this game, yes. Yes, yes. 
So that is the app we found. It's a pretty old application. If we look at uh, matchinggames.logic, it's targeting .NET Framework 4.5. So the first thing we want to do, as you mentioned, we want to make a target .NET standard. To do so, first we need to convert it to a pro SDK project style. So if we unload the project and look at the project file, right now, look at it. First of all, this like is crazy. This, this is the project file right. format we've had in .NET uh, for many, many years now. And you look, it's very complicated. It's got lots of lines. It's you can never type this by hand. Right. As we started thinking about core, we said, hey, can we re re rethink this, this file? Because we, we knew we wanted to go to Windows, Mac, and Linux, and maybe use you know, editors outside of VS. Right. And so we want to make this human typable. Yes. Um, and so we're going to show you uh, converting this yeah. to a very simple format. So to convert it, I'm going to delete it all. And I'm going to use just those five lines. So that is a new SDK style project where we have a SDK reference, Microsoft.NET.SDK. And we have a target framework version, which is .NET 4.7.2. So that's the, all you need for your SDK project. I want to, want to pull out one more point here. One of the nice things about this new format is mm -hmm. you notice it doesn't list all the files in my project. Right. So right. it used to be that when you were actually editing a, a project, every time you added a file or removed a file, mm -hmm. you, had to, you had to use source control to check in or check out the, yeah. uh, the project file. The project file no longer changes yes. because those files aren't listed. Yes. So let's reload the project file and let's try to build it. So right now, right. we have yeah, some, some fails. Yeah, let's take a look what it is. So it says that it, is d it has duplicated uh, files. Do you have any idea why it can be? So let's l open the project up a little bit here. Yeah. And go to Properties. Let's see. There's an assembly info. Right. So today, all of our .NET projects contain a file called assembly info. And that's where mm -hmm. you put things like the version attributes and stuff yeah. like that. Um, as we move to these SDK style projects, we thought it would be a good idea uh, to remove the need for this file and let you just put that, that in the actual project file. And so what's going on here is uh, the SD, SDK style project trying to generate that itself. And it's, it's, it's causing a conflict because you already mm -hmm. have one of these. So we can, right. we can turn that off so inside of here. Let's turn it off. So for that, we do generate assembly info. Awesome info and we set it to false. All right, let's save and rebuild it. And now we have awesome. Success. So you're compiling again. So we now we move this to Perfect. an SDK style project. It's compiling, but you were saying right. before we want to go to net standard two. Exactly. Right now let's point it to .NET standard. So 2.0. And, and so by doing this, now this library is compatible with a mobile app, a web with, app, all yes, of the things. But everything. But we still have some errors. Oh no, there's an error and here now. Yes. Let me explain .NET Standard a little bit. .NET Standard is the APIs that exist on all of the platforms. So nothing can be in .NET Standard unless it right. runs on Mac, Windows, Linux, and our mobile platforms. And mm -hmm. so in this case, you're getting an error because registry is a Windows only concept. Exactly. Um, and so that code can't run on a Mac or yeah. Linux. And so um, you'll have to do well, something to fix it. Yes. Good thing we have WinForms application. So we know we're going to run it on Windows, right? So in this case, I can add compatibility pack, which will contain the AP missing APIs. To do that, we can go to manage NuGet packages and look for Microsoft.Windows.Compatibility. Let's uncheck the uh, include previews Let's here. Let's do that, Let's not yes. grab a preview build of that. Exactly. So we're going to install it, which will add about 20,000 APIs, right? Yes. Some of them are Windows only. Some of them are cross-platform. And see, now it's gone. All your errors went away. Yep. Now we can use registry. But now you might ask yourself a question. Yeah. What if you know, yeah. I've added this Windows compatibility pack. What if I do kind of care about where I can run or I want to see if my code is compatible? How, what would you do? To, what would you recommend, Alia, to, to let me know if my code can run on all the platforms? We have a solution for that too. 
That is called Compatibility Analyzer. So we can also install a NuGet package called Microsoft.NET Analyzer's this Compatibility. One's currently in it is in preview, so we need to check include pre releases. And we're going to install the analyzer. Once it's there, we will be prompted for all APIs that are not cross platform. So we can go nice. navigate so it our tells me code. Mac, it tells me that will not run on Mac and Linux. So it's actually giving me a nice rich error message saying. Exactly. Yeah. Also, it includes individual links. So you can go on web and you can check out what is wrong with this particular API. Another good thing you can disable is suppress it. You can suppress it in source or in suppression file. So if you decided that using registry is OK, I don't want to be prompted, I don't want to see those uh, notifications again, you can do that too. And another cool thing about compatibility analyzer, it will prompt you if you're using deprecated APIs as well. So I think cool. our logic project fully migrated ready for .NET Core, and here so, we... So let's convert the app yeah. to the actual app to .NET Core. So what we're going to do, as I said before, is um, we don't have templates in Visual Studio yet for right. the core uh, WinForm yeah. and WPF projects, so I have to drop to command line. So I'm going to okay. bring the command prompt up, um, and here I am in my folder uh, with my projects, and I'm going to say uh, .NET new WinForms, and I'm going to do dash O, and say matching game core. What this will do is create me a brand new WinForms project in the folder called matching game core. Press return there to make that happen. Mm -hmm. There we go, it's created. Now I'll go back to Visual Studio and what we'll do is we'll go and add an existing project, that new one we just created. There it is, to my VS. Um, so here it is. I'm going to make it my default project. And it's not going to be the matching game because I uh, just created that new template. Yeah. So if I run this, you see oh. hello.net hello. core, ta da. Yeah. Um, <laughs> kind of cool. So I'm going to do a few things now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to first off delete all the source code from this. Because mm -hmm. um, I'm going to basically map this project into the existing.NET framework application we have up here. So this is another feature of SDK, SDK style projects. As I mentioned before, um, you know, we don't, you don't see a list of the files that mm -hmm. are actually included in the project here. We basically infer these automatically. Now what's right. cool is I can, uh, I got a snippet over here. Um, I can actually change inferring it from the local directory and, 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 mm -hmm. and specify where I want the code to come from. So it says mm -hmm. item group compile include and I can give it a folder. Uh, now, what's cool here is I can just replace this with, I'm going to go up a folder, go into matching game. That is the .NET framework mm -hmm. version of the application. Um, oh. And I'll press save. And when I do, you'll see the files just start showing up over here in my project. So that's kind of cool. That is very cool. Um, yep. You mentioned before that um, uh, you know, we had to generate a simply info thing. Right. This will have the right. same problem because that older uh, yeah. WinForm project has an assembly info inside of it, so Indeed. I'll need to come over here and go uh, generate assembly info, and we'll set that to false as well. Mm -hmm. um, so now I've said ignore the, don't make a, an assembly info, include the files from the other project. And so if I do a build now, okay, hmm, you have errors. Got a couple of errors here. Uh, the primary error is this game. Uh, is looking for uh, that class library that you generated and converted right. to uh, .NET Core. So I'm going to go and add a reference to that as well. So let's go add a reference. Let's go add that gaming logic back. Mm -hmm. um, and if you go into my CS proj, uh, you can see oh. the, the wrong one. If I go into my CS proj right here. You can see I've got my, yeah. my files, my matching game. I should be good to go. Let's do a build. Let's it see. all builds. And let's run it. Here's my matching game awesome. running on .NET Core. Um, that wasn't <laughs> super hard to convert, I don't think. Yeah, that was pretty easy. Now, so
Scott, if I want to make some tweaks to design, you, s you mentioned it's not available in Core 3. How can I do that? Right. So the, the Visual Studio 2019 doesn't have support for designers for Core 3 right, right now. So here's my form. If I double-click my form, I just go to source code. I don't really, I don't see the designer. Yeah. Now, because I mapped the source code into the .NET Framework project, mm -hmm. I can go into my .NET Framework project. Let's go in it, into that project. Here's my main form. I'll double-click it. Oh. Now I'll see the designer. Um, and let's make a small change yeah. here. Let's, let's go, see if it works. Let's go change the title to be, let's add core to it. Press return. You see the, the change in the designer. Mm -hmm. Now, if I save that, so I went and changed, used the designer from the .NET Framework project, right. but now if I run my core project, you see yeah. that the title changed right here. Awesome. That flows all the way through. Perfect. Um, so it's not super difficult to yeah. update a project. Your mileage is going to vary. It could be harder. Uh, but the, the, the concepts are not super complicated, yeah. and we'll make all this available in a blog post as this video comes out. So let's close that out. And I had one more uh, part of this project I wanted to show. So let's go back to slides for a second. And I want to talk about um, ASP.NET Core 3 Razor components. So as I said, .NET Core 3 is not just about the desktop. We yeah. have a whole pile of invest investments coming in for machine learning and coming into the web platform. The primary web platform things that I think about today are we're going to add some microservice templates and some great ways to build code that runs great in all the cloud arc infrastructures like Kubernetes and stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's another exciting web component we've been showing for a while. Um, it was under the term codename Blazor. Um, now, it's, now we're calling it Razor Components. Um, mm -hmm. And what this lets you do is it lets you build uh, web UI uh, that has a SPA feel to it, all in C Sharp. Today, if you build a, a SPA, that's a modern, you know, no refresh the page yeah. kind of web app, uh, you're likely to be using something like AngularJS, uh, React, or Vue to build that application. Uh, what we want to let you do, though, is, you know, we're not trying to say don't use those libraries. They're great libraries, but it should be a choice. Right. Um, so now you can decide to stay in C Sharp if you want. And there's some benefits of staying in C Sharp. You can actually share the exact type from the server part of your application to the client part of your application, and it's strongly typed uh, back and forth. Uh, you can share the same C, C Sharp code, uh, like a, a standard clash. You can share it on the server to the client. Uh, and even better, with um, uh, we have something called WebAssembly coming in the future, um, and it will let you compile the client code into more native native code and you've almost native performance inside mm -hmm. the browser. Um, and the cool thing is it requires no plugins. There's no Flash or Silverlight or, or ActiveX or any plugin right. required. It just works in all the browsers, both on the desktop and in mobile. Um, and so it's it's pretty cool tech. So let's let's do a quick demo uh, of Blazor. Uh, we're going to show it a couple times uh, today. So let me drop out of slides. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into my matching game, and I have a, a slightly different version of it that I'm going to open up uh, in Visual Studio 2017. Why 2017? Uh, at this point, uh, the prototypes we have of Blazor mm -hmm. uh, are not running in VS 2019. Oh, I see. Uh, that's coming pretty soon, okay. but we don't have it yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, I'd, what I think we start with is just let's, let's show what this app would look like. So this is a, um, an ASP.NET Razor component application. I'm going to run it, and this time instead of the, um, you know, the uh, WinForm app opening right. up, I'm actually seeing a web page open up here, and oh. you'll notice that as I click, this looks yeah. a lot like um, the app we saw earlier. Right. Except now it's running in the browser. I can create a new game. Um, I can click the tiles. There's no browser refresh. Right. It's pretty cool. It has amazing effects. Uh, good effects uh, using CSS. And just quickly, I was going to jump in and show you um, what this app looks like. So this app, uh, a Blazor app, starts off running the app.cshml, and you're going to see this matching card game. And you're so like, that's it. That's not. <laughs> that, that's that's kind of weird. That's not HTML. There's no HTML element called matching card game. Right. In a Razor component app. Um, you can build your own tags for HTML. 
I see. Um, and so in this case, notice that I have a file over here called matching card game .cshtml. Uh -huh. um, I can use that as the uh, that maps to matching card game. Mm -hmm. So anything I put in a razor file, it's called a component because I can then reference that file as an HTML element. So whenever I Very put a nice. matching card game element in a in a source code file, it's running this razor page, and you can see this razor uh -huh. page basically. Um, tries to show the best score. If there's a message, it puts the message up. Um, but literally, you see it it, it, it does a loop over the rows and the columns and puts a bunch of cards, those mm -hmm. same cards we saw. Mm -hmm. um, and if I go look at the back end of this file, there's a CS file behind this. And you can see when the page first loads, we start the game. Uh, when a card is clicked, you can see the logic that does this. This actually, the, this code will look very similar to the WinForm code. Nice. Um, and so that's Razor Pages and uh, uh, Razor Pages with Razor Components. Very exciting tech, uh, pretty awesome. Uh, please look into that. So let's go back over here. And I'm going to pass it back to Alia and we're going to talk about ML.NET. Yes, so great news. We're adding machine learning support to .NET and uh, new machine learning framework called ML.NET allows developers to create, train, and uh, use machine learning models from their .NET applications. So when usually we think about machine learning, we think Python, TensorFlow, data scientists, right? Now .NET developers can use existing set of APIs and write machine learning models in their uh, apps using C Sharp or F Sharp. Exactly. Our goal is not to go and try to replace those other technologies. Right. We just want to say we have a lot of .NET developers and they want to use the .NET skills they have yeah. today exactly. to use machine learning. They shouldn't have to go learn another language or another platform yes. or become a data yeah. scientist. How do we enable a .NET developer yeah. to, to use ML? Yeah. Also, you don't need to write a bunch of glue code between different machine learning libraries, frameworks, and your .NET application. Now it's all in one place. Cool. And we tried it to make it developer focused, so it uh, allows developers to use uh, so the skills they have today. Yeah, yeah, and APIs. ML.NET is very extensible. It supports uh, integration with Onyx. I don't know if you heard of it. That is a standard for machine learning data science. So any platform that supports that can create a model, and uh, in, we can import uh, that model in our .NET application using Onyx. We also have a support for TensorFlow. So if your data scientist created the model in TensorFlow, you can also use it in your .NET applications. Nice. And uh, ML.NET is uh, tested and quality proven. We've been using it for over decades, I would say, right? In Windows, in SQL Server. Um, Office and Office, Bing. right, right. So, and uh, it's open source as everything .NET Core. Uh, open source code is there. You can look at us developing it, you can develop it with us, contribute and participate in creation of new machine learning framework for .NET. Nice. And uh, what you can do with ML.NET today, we have a, a set of samples where you can play and see, you can find the standard scenarios. Yeah, I ask the teams all the time that yeah. uh, I mean, when, when I think of ML, I remember talking to customers uh, a year or so ago and they're like, hey, are you interested in ML? <laughs> yes. Um, what would you use it for? I don't know. Right. And so I, I went and really asked the team, let's go find the common problems that mm -hmm. you can solve with ML, and let's have some awesome samples on our GitHub repo yeah. uh, to make it easy to do the very common things you might want to do in ML. So yeah, you've got yeah. a whole bunch of these on the screen here. Exactly. For example, you can do sentiment analysis. You can tell if a review is positive or negative, or you can do forecasting where you can predict the amount of sales in the next months. You can do recommending where you have a set of products that your users might be interested in, or uh, movies related to a movie you just watched. Image recognition, image classification, uh, object detection on a picture, and many more. So all those samples are available under our GitHub repository, machine learning their samples, and I encourage you guys to check it out. Mm. Yep, give us your feedback. Cool. 
And uh, we released the preview version in spring 2018. It was May, actually, of 2019. May, right, where we around the, the first preview um, at the Build Conference. Build Conference, right. And right now, it's uh, preview version 0 0.9. We're hoping to release the full version around May 2019. Awesome. Yeah. Now, let me show you a demo of ML.NET. So, to demonstrate ML.NET, I decided to pick a very well-known problem of uh, sentiment analysis, which is using binary classification. So, we want to get our user's review and tell how happy or how, how satisfied our customers are, how positive the review is. Bef before you start, I want to point out, this is a, a uh, Razor Components app. Uh, right. You can see I've got a text area. This is HTML, mm -hmm. um, where the user can type some text, right. and it's got a update score. So inside of that page, when I type text, it calls the C sharp in this page, um, starting with the default of happiness of fifty, yeah. um, and then you can see that it uh, it then takes the text and passes it on, um, and there's a scale that shows the scale. So if you run the app, um, we should see that app. text input, and we should see a, a scale that we have there. Exactly. Okay, so here's the text cool. input. Let's try to type something happy. Because this is Blazor. As you're typing, it's happening in real time. It's a, it's a spa type application that's written fully in C sharp, but now you're using ML.net yeah. to actually, that's pretty cool. Keep typing. That. Can you make it happier? This, oh, let me try. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Nice. Um, so can we show the code? I mean, yeah, let's, let's debug it. So, how about we put a breakpoint here? Put a breakpoint on the var text. On the var text. Yes. And go back and to your code. Back to the browser. Back to browser. Let's type let's, uh, some text there. Okay. We hit and the breakpoint. This break is pretty point. cool. So, I can F11 into this, mm -hmm. and my text should show up there in real time. Happy I can then F11 awesome. into the predict. Let's, yeah. Now, this is interesting. I'm, I'm looking here at this code, and I see. Uh, where we load a model, yeah. sentiment.zip into the application. This is a static class. When the static class is created, it loads a model. And then all you've got to do is call this predict um, on that. And when you do, it returns you a value back. So right. the reality is I only had to write two lines exactly. of code in my For application to take advantage of that model. Obviously, somebody wrote some code to go yeah. build, generate the model already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the, the whole point of ML.net is I can take uh, a generated model, and within one or two or three, you know, a handful of lines, I can go you execute can that and get a, get a value out yeah, of it. Yeah, exactly. So, if you so keep leveling through that, I think we'll get back to that. It returns a percentage, right? A probability that we turn into a percentage. And uh, let's see. So, it says 90.66. Cool. Let's press 90.7. Yep. So I think the point there is, you know, you took a model that somebody had built, mm -hmm. and in just a few lines of, of .NET code, you're able to consume and use that model. Um, and also, you get to see another example of a spa-type ASP.NET application right. taking advantage of Razor Pages to show that. That's, that is awesome. Yeah, exactly. And with ML.NET, you can not only inference, but also build and train model on your custom data. So you can make it as tailored to your particular type of problem as you wish. That and is amazing. Right. It also works offline, right? So you can deploy that model to IoT device. You do not need to constant connection to internet. So that, that is a power of a model net. Cool. To recap, you know, we talked about three big things today. One is .NET Core 3 Preview 2. Yep. Uh, here's the URL to download that today. We talked about ML.NET uh, 0.9. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a link to download that. And obviously, to take advantage of all the Core 3 stuff, you need to be on a preview of, of Visual Studio 2019. And yeah. I've got a link to that as well. Um, you know, to kind of close, I want to go back to where we started. We think of .NET being a platform that no matter what app you're building, whether it's desktop, web, cloud, mobile, gaming, IoT, or AI, we have a solution for you. So, uh, Ollie and I say thank you very much for listening today. Thank and you. And I hope this helps you uh, port your first application uh, to .NET Core 3. Right. Happy coding. Thank you. Thanks.